When is Windows not Windows? When it's Linux. Hello everyone and welcome to Tech Fix Flicks. In this tutorial, we install and take a first look at Linux FX, also known as Windows FX, a lightweight Linux based operating system with a user interface designed to very closely replicate the appearance and functionality of Windows 10. It's important from the outset to provide clarity about what exactly this is and what it isn't. Specifically, it isn't Windows, and programs designed to run on a Windows machine won't run by default on this platform, unless they've been specifically coded for Linux or can be made to run using Wine, software which interprets Windows programs to enable them to be run under Linux. Whilst this isn't Windows, it's an interesting Linux variant which bears considerable cosmetic similarity to Windows 10, and has next to no learning curve for those familiar with the Microsoft product. Inevitably, this will lead to comparison with Windows, and this walkthrough will necessarily draw comparison throughout. We begin at the homepage shown on screen now, and linked in the written description accompanying this video. The site, like the platform itself, is rooted in Brazilian Portuguese, and there are influences of this throughout, as we'll see later. Taking advantage of the English language translation, we see the unobstructed homepage. Heading to the Downloads page, noting that variants are available not only for 64-bit PC architecture, but also for the 2nd, 3rd and 4th generation Raspberry Pi, as well as the ASUS Tinkerboard. We're downloading the 64-bit PC version, enjoying the irony of using a Windows device to download its imposter. We're redirected to SourceForge, where we make our choices in relation to our privacy options. We then click the large download button, allowing the download to commence. The download is a 3.7GB ISO, which took a little longer than expected, even for a file of that size. Once the download is complete, and here we're using Google Chrome, we click for a menu. We select the option to show in folder. With our ISO now shown in our downloads folder, we can create a bootable USB installer using the technique shown in the video detailed on screen now, and again linked in the written description. Alternatively, the ISO file can be used directly as a virtual optical disk in VirtualBox, and we'll be running a virtual machine for the duration of this video. We now start up our machine. For the next few minutes, the format of this video will be somewhat disproportionate, due to the mismatch between this video's 16.9 resolution and the squarer format of the installer. Normal service will resume once we configure our graphics options during setup. We're immediately drawn to the parallels here with Windows, and in particular the use of the Windows logo. This will be a recurring theme throughout the video, and we can't help but wonder whether Microsoft will object to the use of their logo and other proprietary imagery. If the ISO isn't available for download by the time you watch this, we'll know that Microsoft's lawyers weren't impressed. After the integrity check, we enter a live environment. If you're familiar with the concept of the live CD, or more recently the live USB, you'll understand what you're seeing here. If not, this is essentially a version of the operating system running directly from the installation media. At this stage, the operating system isn't permanently installed, but the live environment both facilitates the installation of the full version and exactly resembles it. We're introduced to the Cortana-like Helloa, and we click Next. At the language selection screen, we opt for English, although subtle hints of Portuguese filter through in the English version, breaking the Windows illusion. We click Next. The operating system detects that it's running in the live CD environment, and offers to perform the full installation. It also detects that we're running a virtual machine, which clearly poses certain challenges by comparison to running on a physical machine. We again click Next. This phase of the installation understandably more closely parallels a Linux installation than a Windows one. Incidentally, if you're an experienced installer and would prefer to jump to the interface tour, the timecode for that chapter will be shown on screen now. At the language selection screen, we click the drop down, where we have the option to select from a substantial list, and in our case, the availability of British English is always appreciated. Although we introduced the software as Linux FX, the name Windows FX is extensively used hereafter, and there's a duality of identity which may pose a slight issue here. We select the Europe London time zone to reflect our localization, and this can be changed via the drop downs. We click Next, taking us to our keyboard options, selectable from lists and the drop down. In this instance, we accept the default by clicking Next. The partitioning options are obviously more consequential when using a hard drive already populated with data. As we're using a virtual hard disk on a virtual machine, we're happy to select Erase Disk. 
If you follow this example, please be aware that this will entirely erase the hard drive and that you'll be doing so entirely at your own risk. The disk usage after installation is shown and we again click next, taking us to the user information and password choice. With our details entered, we click next and are taken to the full installation summary where we have the option to return if we're unhappy by clicking back. Alternatively, we can click install to proceed. A final warning offers our last chance to exit, but we click install now. The installation is slower than some Linux variants, but faster than Windows. Progress is indicated by the bar in the lower portion of the screen, along with some interesting graphics, again offering a flavour of Brazil. Once complete, we are ready to restart and exit the live environment. Our startup screen borrows heavily from Windows. You may need to remove installation media if it hasn't been removed from the drive. Once removed, we proceed to the login with its incredibly heavy Windows influence. We enter our password as defined during the initial setup and press enter or click the arrow to advance. Again, our use of the virtual machine is detected as problematic, but we'll press on. We select the option to configure the monitor resolution and click next. The current resolution is shown and we click the drop down to change it. The list of supported resolutions is shown and we install VirtualBox guest editions for the virtual machine to add extra possibilities. Having done so, we change the resolution to 1920 by 1080 to match the resolution of this video, meaning that you should finally be watching in our preferred format. When we click apply, the system checks that we're happy with the resolution and we click the option to keep this configuration. Finally, we click to close the display window. At last, we see the unobstructed desktop. Although it's clearly distinct, it also shares many cosmetic similarities to Windows proper. As we're now fully installed, let's take a tour of the system, starting with computer. Opening computer closely parallels File Explorer in Windows 10, and we can maximise the window in exactly the manner we'd expect. Our file system drive is functionally equivalent to Windows C drive, although opening it reminds us that we're very much in Linux territory here. Progressing through the left navigation menu, we can see that the home folder contains some very familiar icons, although the desktop, documents, music, pictures, videos and downloads folders are empty by default, not even containing sample files. Obviously we wouldn't expect any recent files at this preliminary stage, and we've already seen the content of our file system folder. We have a rubbish bin, rather than the traditional recycle bin. We see a virtual DVD in the Devices folder, which is the VirtualBox guest editions previously used to expand our graphics options. Finally, our network connections show devices discoverable on the network. Returning to the Home folder, we can change our view to List or Compact View. We can also click to toggle our Location view, equivalent to clicking within the Windows address bar. There are a number of options available from right-clicking the desktop, most notably the option to change the desktop background, with a selection of wallpapers available by default. We'll quickly put up a montage of the wallpapers, and if nothing else, we might repurpose some of these in our regular Windows installation. Clicking the Start button equivalent, we see a menu which, while stylistically similar to Windows 10, contains a distinctly Linux selection of apps. Launching the traditional control panel icon takes us to Windows FX settings, again borrowing substantially from the Windows 10 icon pool. We'll take a quick tour of each of these sub-options, which occasionally parallel and occasionally break away from their Windows equivalents. A recurring issue within these pages are the questionable linguistic choices, which detract from the overall polish of the presentation. Whilst we wouldn't fare at all well in reverse with Portuguese, there are fundamental spelling and grammar issues which must be resolved if Windows FX is to graduate to the next level. Whilst some won't care or notice, we absolutely do, and simply wouldn't consider making daily use of an operating system which falls below basic standards of language. These settings screens are again purposefully designed to closely parallel their Windows equivalents, although the design illusion is regularly broken as a consequence of the attempt to shoehorn Linux settings within a full Windows interface. Authentication is required to enter the Update and Security section, and the password again is that defined during initial setup. Having entered our password, we repeatedly failed to get this to work during our testing, but this was most likely the consequence of working on a virtual machine. The intriguing EXE and MSI compatibility promises the opportunity for enhanced compatibility with genuine Windows software. Again, this serves as a reminder that this is a sophisticated cosmetic skinning of Linux and cannot be expected to run software designed for Windows. 
We again need to provide confirmation of our consent to run the tool by clicking yes here. Again, note the panel the control header, breaking the windows illusion. The next warning is wholly misleading, giving the impression that we should be hands off during the installation. This isn't true and we need to manage the process throughout. We click OK. The please wait banner compounds the previous confusion because we're very much still in the driving seat for the installation here. Despite appearances, we shouldn't be waiting here. We need to click the almost hidden button agreeing to the license terms. Then we need to click install. The installation now takes place. Once complete, we click finish. With the please wait message still displayed, we appear to loop back for a second reinstallation, this time with a different version of the .NET framework. We therefore click continue. We see an obscure .NET logo. For a second time, we accept the license terms before clicking install. Once again, we wait as installation progresses. On completion, we click finish. Finally, we click to restart now. Unlike our previous restart, we never actually exit the desktop for this one. Continuing the tour, the icon we traditionally associate with the Windows Store takes us to a Linux store containing a large selection of software broken down into categories, including audio and video, communication and news, productivity, games, graphics and photography, add-ons, a category itself broken down into codecs, fonts, hardware drivers and input sources. We can review our installed software and check for updates. Terminal predictably launches the classic terminal window. Finally, we have options to lock the screen, log out or shut down. The all applications list is extensive, although there are more manageable subcategories, including accessories, education, games, graphics, internet, office, programming, sound and video, universal access, administration and preferences. Places largely mirrors the functionality of the home folder. Let's return briefly to Office. Whilst the icons are liberally borrowed from Microsoft Office, the suite itself is the popular free alternative LibreOffice, which is also available for Windows. Clearing the tip of the day, we can see that from a design perspective, there's a great deal of convergence with Microsoft Word. Although heading to the file menu and saving the document, we can see that the default file format is the open document format, with the .odf extension. To access Word's familiar .doc and .docx, we click the drop down to make the appropriate selection. The Calc application equally shares a design philosophy with Microsoft Excel. The small double arrow to the right of the Start button provides similar functionality to right-clicking the Windows Start button for the alternative Start menu. The Google button predictably produces a search bar, allowing us to perform a search directly, with results displayed in a browser window. Oh, they look like interesting videos. Whilst on the subject of our videos, be sure to check out our back catalogue and subscribe for our future projects. That was shameless. Moving swiftly on, Haloa has its own desktop icon. We're sure it'll be used with the same frequency as Cortana. Chrome is installed by default, saving us the bother of loading Edge that one time to download it. It works exactly as you'd expect, with a secondary tab opening at startup for DistroWatch. In the final stretch, we have a CPU usage indicator to the right, which can be clicked to reveal a more detailed breakdown. Similarly, we have a small weather summary, which can be expanded to yield a more detailed summary. AnyDesk is available by default. We weren't aware of it, but it immediately reminded us of another pre-installed app, our old favourite TeamViewer, which can be accessed from the All Programs list. Our Removable Drives list details our attached drives. We can see our network status and click for further options. We have a simple volume level, leading to further audio controls. Our date and time information can be clicked to reveal the calendar. Unlike Windows, the rightmost icon offers session options, allowing us to log out or shut down. As Windows traditionalists, we always look left for our power options, and naturally, this too is provided. Whether this duality is necessary is debatable, and we prefer all options to be available on the left, exactly like Windows. Clicking the drop down presents the commonly used power options, and we select power off, appropriately bringing this video to a close. We've seen a very interesting and competent attempt to replicate the Windows environment using Linux, and Windows FX potentially represents an ideal introduction for those looking to migrate away from Windows toward a Linux-based system. In doing so, Windows FX strays a little too far over the line, and we can't envisage Microsoft tolerating some fairly gross infringements of its intellectual property and imagery. Windows FX is far from perfect, and presentational issues, especially with language, potentially prevent it from being elevated from idle curiosity to something more substantial. 
Nevertheless, it's a very credible attempt to recreate the Windows environment within Linux. Join us next time when we undertake a similar adventure simulating macOS. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you found it useful, please consider subscribing by clicking the logo on screen now. If you'd like to see more, there are two suggestions currently on screen. If you have a better, faster or more economical solution, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. You're also welcome to follow us on Twitter. Until your next tech fix, goodbye.